Good morning, everybody who could be here at 9 a.m. I just wanted to take a moment before we started my presentation to introduce myself a little bit um, so you get to know a little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Lily Meek, and I am a senior at Pacific University. Uh, I'm an environmental biology emphasis major. I also went to Belize in the summer of 2019, which is the project that I'm going to be uh, presenting today. And I studied this really amazing fish called uh, the parrotfish out in my time in Belize. And I really had a blast out there and I really wouldn't trade the experience for any other one in the entire world. So to introduce my topic, firstly, my project is named a survey study in the abundance of parrotfish, spare summer variety in Belize marine protected areas and marine unprotected areas. And there's a uh, video over here to the left uh, that I took of the fish that I studied. So this is what a pair of fish looks like. So firstly, I just want to say that this fish is really cool because this is a fish that poops sand and has a beak. Yeah, you heard me right. This is probably the most majestic excretion I have ever seen. And the fish has teeth, which it really incited my curiosity into the species. And this is why I really want to share my findings and uh, with you to see how these fish are doing out in the wild. So before I get into the logistics about parrotfish, I really wanna introduce the country of Belize. Belize is a beautiful country that, re that resides in between Mexico and Guatemala. It is a subtropical biome and has harbors that are composed of the largest unbroken barrier reef in the Western hemisphere. With this said, about 120 different locations are protected. So this means approximately 38% of Belize's terrestrial land is covered and protected and about 10% of marine bios are protected. Majority of the people uh, in Belize actually strive to protect the area more so than actual local government, which I think is really cool of the community to do that. So I just wanted to talk a little about some interesting fun facts, uh, background information about the parrotfish uh, before we really dive into the research. Parrotfish reside mostly in the Western Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. Most interestingly too, uh, parrotfish are actually sequential hermaphrodites, uh, which means that they have initial and terminal phases. Um, but what's super interesting is that they actually switch um, genders throughout their life cycle. So parrotfish usually school in, in like about a dozen and there's always one dominant male which is called a terminal. Terminal males are kind of like steal the show. They have bright colors and they, you can't miss them in the ocean. You know, they pass right by you and their intense colors just kind of jump right at you. Uh, and they're super beautiful, 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 beautiful fish. Uh, the initial phases are all the females um, and a loss of a dominant male actually turns uh, the females from the initial phase into the terminal phase. Another interesting uh, little tidbit about the parrotfish is that their beak are actually fused teeth, which is also a really interesting thing to see in a fish. And then an additional fact about the uh, parrotfish, the fish that I studied in the Caribbean, uh, so the stoplight parrotfish, um, has permanent territory grounds uh, within their reefs, which we will talk about more later why that's actually pretty crucial and interesting piece of information and why I wanted to look and study this fish. So now let's move on to the ecological importance of parrotfish. Parrotfish, so there are approximately about 90 total Western Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean Sea parrotfish species. There is a lot of them. They are high in biodiversity, um, which makes them all a little bit unique. Parrotfish also have a beak that helps scrape off microalgae off coral um, in which that compete with coral reefs for additional resources such as sunlight and nutrients um, and so that they also just don't smother corals in general. Parrotfish also scrape the substrates of corals and also eat sponges which help in the um, growth of corals and because of the coral substrate consumption they have they also excrete undigested sand, which helps aid in nutrient cycling. And you can imagine that if uh, a fish can excrete sand and have that amazing ability, they're gonna create uh, what's called sand building. And approximately 85% of new sediment uh, on islands 
So all the white sand that you see in tropical islands primarily come from pear fish excretion. So next time you're in a tropical place and it has white sand, you're sitting on pear fish poop. Uh, so you can only imagine that pear fish help um, nutrient cycling and contribute to island stability um, when sand is lost. There's also a strong correlation with reefs and parrot fish. Usually in tropical areas where there is reefs, there are parrot fish and where there are parrot fish, there are reefs. But a lot of the ecological importance are largely unknown. All we know is that the removal of parrot fish is detrimental um, because these are the only fish that have a unique niche to excrete sand and consume coral substrates as uh, rigorously as they do which helps aid and promote coral growth when agitated. Since they have these really unique components to consume coral microalgae and sponges, we really just wanted to look at them more closely and feel like it is important to look at them more closely because about approximately 70% of parrotfish in the Caribbean are actually regionally removed due to overfishing and bycatch. And I really looked at this and you know, thought to myself, how come this fish wasn't really being looked at closer or being more closely monitored? Because of this, I wanted to look at parrotfish population numbers in um, marine protected areas and marine unprotected areas. And the reason why I say that is because the protected areas are notoriously known for just kind of, are known to just kind of have just a title, often called the paper park. So paper parks are protected parks on paper, but there's actually no action going towards protecting and actively protecting uh, these areas. So I want to see if these parks are actually providing some refuge for these population numbers um, and if they were going to differ in numbers between protected and unprotected areas and what ecological impacts how do we see observationally in these areas. With this said, called the stoplight parrotfish, is territorial and resides mainly in um, reefs for its lifetime. And I thought that was really interesting and thought that there might be some ecological importance there. So we've seen these two photos before. I just wanted to reshow them so that you know what the stoplight parrotfish looks like. I really wanted to look at these fish to determine if their abundance in protected areas and unprotected areas differ. With this said, um, I will be comparing the stoplight parrotfish population numbers to the general parrotfish population numbers um, so I can get a better analysis and insight on how these abundances are doing compared to the other ones. I exited a statement for my paper where I started to question the relationship between stoplight parrotfish and its reef status thinking that there might be some correlation between reef status and the presence of the fish in them. Our question developed into, does the presence of stoplight adult pearfish differ significantly due to the status of the reef? With this information, I'll answer this question now by showing you a video on how I did my methods. Welcome to my methods video. My methods were developed by one central question. How am I going to survey this little fish and where do I start? Confused on how to research the ocean, I looked for guidance from Dr. Deke Gunderson, my advisor and professor from Pacific and his ocean friend named Ken. Ken is a very laid back and he has this boat called the Goliath. You can catch him standing on the railings just like he does in this video majority of the time. He owns an education center and that I will talk more about later. Finding research and how to do this project was tedious. And I felt like this and this and this as time went on and my trip to Belize was nearing. My knowledge was close to nothing in science and research in my sophomore year of college. So I did what any sane person would do. I panicked. Both Ken and Deke told me to relax and gave me a starting point to kickstart this research in the right direction. Deke and Ken told me that not all reefs are the same types of reefs. Some reefs are patch types, others are barriers and so on. Thus, I would need to have all my sites be similar types of reefs for my research. Ken owns an education center called TREC, which stands for Tropical Research Plus Education Center in San Pedro, Belize. Ken has lived in Belize for quite some time and is practically a local. He knows a lot about the oral and local history of different reefs. 
ones that are mapped and others that are not. Ken has inside knowledge on these Belizean reefs that researchers like me don't have because we are not familiar with the reefs or their history. Thus, I partnered with Trek and Ken to give me the best possible position to succeed in this research project. Ken then gave me a list of all the snorkeling sites that Trek frequently visits that have protected reefs and unprotected reef statuses. With this list, we divided the reefs into two categories called MPAs and UPAs, which stands for Marine Protected Areas and Unprotected Areas. We then selected a total of four reefs from these two categories. We tried to choose all four locations as close as possible to patch reefs, so our data wasn't skewed by reef type. We ended up surveying the marine protected areas called Hole Chan and Mexico Rocks. The unprotected sites surveyed are Coral Gardens and Key Cocker. We then decided to divide the data collection into three main parts with our patients. The first being background information. The second is trial data, and the third, qualitative data. The information collected in part one of our methods primarily consisted of historical context of Ken's pre snorkeling lectures on the Goliath. This information consisted mainly of reef history and locational knowledge. The second portion of part one's methods was to collect information at each site before entering the water to survey parafish. Things contained were things like weather, temperature, the time we visited the reef, reef status, reef depth and type, and most importantly, the geographical location. In part two of our methods, we required a total of three volunteer surveyors with extensive identification knowledge on stoplight and general parafish. Each surveyor received a watch and a slate to tally up the number of terminal and initial stoplight and general parafish seen. Each surveyor would then start their timer to survey their transect for three minutes in a linear fashion, a constant swimming rate while tallying up parafish observations. With all of us in at least an estimated 15 to 20 meter distance between each surveyor, this is what it would look like. After the three minute survey was over, there was a five minute recess in between each survey trial to avoid observing the same pair of fish. After the break, we restarted the same procedure two more times and had a total of three survey trials per location. Part three of our survey consisted of observing the types of coral around and if they have been grazed. No numerical data was collected, only observations of clear pair of fish bite marks. Here are some references as to what they look like. After our time in the ocean, we would transfer our observations and data from the ocean slates onto paper before moving to our next location for the day and continuing our survey. Once our long day at sea was over, we would input everything into our computer, which looks something like this. Trek really set the stage for allowing me to um, go with them on visits or just snorkeling sites to observe these two areas like I had said earlier. So my two marine protected areas just for reiteration, um, is the whole Chan Marine Reserve and Mexico Rocks. And to the right, I have a photo labeled with P's and U's uh, of a GIS map that I had made of San Pedro Belize for the protected sites of San Pedro that I had surveyed. So the sites that are green with the P on it are the protected sites. The marine unprotected sites labeled as UPA are Key Cocker Channel and Coral Gardens that I had surveyed with. Uh, these photos are courtesy to Dee Gunderson, beautiful photos by the way. And then to the right, I have my unprotected San Pedro study sites labeled in red as you. So now I wanted just to provide some insight on how I proceeded to calculate my data without actually telling you and walking you through the data calculations. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of it, I'm just gonna give you the basic summary. So I wanted to create a two-way table to show you the number of stoplight parrotfish and general parrotfish observed to examine the association between the two categorical variables. The P abbreviation stands for protected areas that I had surveyed. The NP stands for the non-protected areas that I had surveyed. The label hashtag of SL represents the number of adult stoplight parrotfish observed. 
the abbreviation hashtag of GP represents the number of adult general parrotfish observed. Then to calculate the expected parrotfish I had, I had to use all the information from the two-way table. To calculate the expected cell counts for the stoplight parrotfish under the assumption that the null hypothesis would be true. The null hypothesis in this case is that there is no association or difference between stoplight and general parrotfish in marine protected and marine unprotected area. Therefore, both areas will not differ in significance in population abundance. These snapshot all the way at the bottom of the equation that you see there with the numbers is the chi-squared test that I had done. And below are its uh, numerical values with it. Basically all the numbers that you had seen before and the chi-square test spit back some numbers at me and the numbers ended up being not significant, meaning that we failed to reject the null hypothesis. So we actually do see that there is no difference between marine protected areas and marine unprotected areas when it comes to the comparison of adult stoplight parrotfish and general parrotfish population numbers. The data in our sample did not provide a strong enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level. Thus, we failed to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% significance level and can conclude that the null hy hypothesis is most likely true. Whereas I had thought that the marine protected and marine unprotected areas would differ, and the alternative hypothesis I had proposed was that they would differ in significance values and that the protected areas would be more of a refuge for parrotfish than the unprotected areas. Moving on to the concern and the conclusion. With previous information provided by other researchers, we know that this is possibly not true, that marine protected areas with good regulation can provide a refuge for marine species. The IUCN Red List considers parrotfish to not be an endangered species or on a radar. But the problem with this is that since 2014, this was the last assessment that we see for parrotfish. Additionally, we know that overfishing has been rapidly increasing since the 1960s and is a large contribution as to why fish biomass in the ocean are declining. As stated earlier, parrotfish are being exploited at a fast rate and about 70% of them have been removed from the Caribbean reefs, where the presence of larger adult parrotfish are starting to become minimal, as noted by other researchers. Scientists have also noted that if there were at least 10% of the parrotfish harvested that were left in the ocean, reefs would actually be more resilient to climate change. Additionally, scientists also discovered that when parrotfish were least exploited and more of their stock was left in the reefs, that there was a trend that algal covers actually decreased. And when parrotfish were most exploited, algal cover increased because of the removal of the fish over the decades. As we know, algae growth harms coral from thriving and reproducing. This is not an ideal situation considering that climate change is a rising concern and continues to be so. Climate change additionally also stresses not only fish, but also stresses corals and the, and the fragile ecosystems that it resides in. Belize is not immune, marine protected status or not, to climate change because we cannot stop a specific zone or region from having increased salinity in waters or temperatures in water too, in which the species cannot fully adapt or rapidly adapt to these rapid changes. Therefore, cultural change and policy implemented to protect these species and to limit the effects of climate change are crucial to possibly saving not only the reefs, but parrotfish and marine life. I wanted to give a thank you to Dr. Deke Gunderson, my advisor, Emily, Marissa, and Megan, to Rich for helping me and advising me and making my presentation and finishing out my capstone. And lastly, Trek for allowing me to visit Belize and do research with them. And here are my work cited. And if any one of you ever have the opportunity or chance to go to Belize, so I highly encourage any one of you to really go out to Belize and uh, when the pandemic is over.
thank you for coming to my capstone presentation and I hope that you have a great day.